Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second uh, lecture um, today by Dr. Kurian and Dr. Zhang. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time today, um, I will just say a little bit of an introduction about the conference itself and introduce uh, both our main speaker and our respondent. So our seminary was awarded a Science for Seminary Seed Grant from the American Association for Advancement of Science, Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion program. And the grant has helped us uh, to fund the Race, Technology, and Healing, Science and Religion in Dialogue project led by our Dr. Ralph Nolasco and uh, myself. So the American Association for the Advancement of Science is the world's largest general scientific society and publisher of the science family of journals. And AAAS was founded in 1848 and includes 261 affiliated societies and academies of science. Um, so that's just a brief introduction. You could always um, you know, uh, do a search on the internet for AAAS and the DOZER program, and you'll see uh, more information on that. Um, so here, you know, through the SEEDS grant, we had been able to create and curate an opportunity for the Garrett community to engage in exploring scientific, social, cultural, psychological, and theological ways to understand uh, a mutual and flourishing notion of the human with forms of relationality that brings about mutual healing. So this afternoon, um, we have Dr. Kirian again, and our um, professor, Dr. Donghyun Chung. So Dr. Kirian was born in Charleston, South Carolina. He is a theoretical physicist, translational, translational scientist, founding director of the Quantum Biology Laboratory at Howard University, and visiting research, profess research professor at the Iowa Advanced Technology Laboratories. As a board member for the AAAS Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, Dr. Kirian advises seminary professors on how to integrate frontier science topics into theological conversations, and he maintains a keen interest in African intellectual and cultural history. And this is what's really exciting to have him here with us today in our context, having this conversation with us. The respondent um, to the presentation will be Dr. Donghyun Zhang, who is Assistant Professor of New Testament Interpretation and the Director of the Center for Asian, Asian American Ministry at Garrett. His research interest engages in intersectional biblical interpretation from and with race and ethnicity, post-humanism, affect theory, and post-colonial perspectives. His forthcoming book, With a Wild Beast, Learning from the Trees, that's the title, With the Wild Beasts, Learning from the Trees, is slated to be published with the Society of Biblical Literature Press, Samara series. So I'd like to turn over now to Dr. Kurian for his second lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Joe. Um, for those of you here, I'm gonna start my screen. Um, hopefully everyone can see it. For those of you who missed the morning session, we had a, a fun time um, discussing a lot of foundational issues. Um, it was a very uh, philosophically oriented talk about the nature of truth and reality. Um, but today uh, for this session, uh, I'd like to focus the conversation around some of the issues that Dr. Joe and Dr. Nolasco raised in the Q&A. So if you missed that, you should probably go back to the recording if you're interested and find out what the pretext of the conversation was. But um, I'm delighted to be here today and I'm, I'm very excited for this community that's forming at Garrett and uh, with AAAS uh, Dozer who has um, stimulated both my growth in the process of asking some of these questions that lie behind the science and underneath the science, and uh, also giving me the opportunity to share with interested listeners about um, what are the limits and what do the limits of science point us to. So um, I want to actually start with a video. Um, if you've coming back from lunch and you want something a little more exciting, uh, this is actually from a 2008 film called Sleep Dealer. Uh, 
directed by Alex Rivera. And uh, I have to give a hat tip to my colleague, Ruha Benjamin, that I know some of you are reading in your uh, uh, reading groups or focus groups. And uh, she pointed this video out. So take a look. Cerca de la colonia donde vivía, en las afueras de la ciudad, estaban las infomaquinas, los sleep dinners. Sorry, everyone. I'm going to fix the, the slides real quick. Give me a second. Sorry about that. So as we return to one of the foundational concepts from the first lecture about our collective representations, the main question that this video and this film raises is whose representations and observational capacities count? Whose subjectivity is given the greatest weight as the uh, foreman says as the young worker comes in, 
is we're giving Americans what they've always wanted, the workers, the work without the workers, right? So what realities can be accessed only by seeing through the eyes of the other? So as we observe trees and rainbows and electrons, we must always keep in mind the context in which we observe. It's a context where value judgments about who and what matters have been made independent of the matter being counted. So some of you will certainly be, fam be familiar with James Cone, a major exponent of black liberation theology who was bold enough to proclaim uh, in his 1975 book that the principalities and powers of evil are the American system symbolized in government officials who oppress the poor, humiliate the weak and make heroes out of rich capitalists. Cohn went on in God of the Oppressed to take aim at his theological colleagues, saying, although Irenaeus and Augustine differ in many respects, neither has much to say about God's empowerment of the oppressed to fight against injustice. The same is true of theologians of Western Christianity who were influenced by them. Cohn goes on, thus white people have a distorted conception of the meaning of violence. They like to think of violence as breaking the laws of their society, but that is a narrow and racist understanding of reality. There is a more deadly form of violence and it is camouflaged in such slogans as law and order, freedom and democracy, and the American way of life. The problem of a whole social structure, which outwardly appears to be ordered and respectable, but inwardly is, quote, ridden by psychopathic obsessions and delusions, racism and hatred. Here's a picture of uh, Walter Scott, who in 2015 was shot in the back by a North Charleston police officer who fired eight rounds at him in the back during a routine traffic stop. A bystander videoed the incident with his phone, which showed the cop shooting, then handcuffing Scott while face down on the ground and placing an object near Scott's body after the fact. There was no concern expressed for Scott's well being, even as another cop joined the scene. Scott died on sight. That video was the crucial observation in the indictment of the police officer. And without it, we can only wonder how the justice system would have handled the case. So I grew up just a few minutes from where Walter was shot. I'm sorely and sadly reminded that Walter was a dear part of the body of Christ, but he was a part that America still fails to recognize beyond a mere statistic in the policies and policing of communities. The Reverend Clementa Pinckney, a man who found time in his busy schedule to mentor students at my high school, spoke out against the tragedy just months before he too was gunned down along with eight others by a white supremacist during their Bible study at Emmanuel AME Church. So there are consequences. There are consequences to the way we think. A good friend of mine told me recently, these systems aren't broken, they have been built. And understanding how they were built is understanding how a legacy of thought has been constructed. So we are taught in an early age to think of the enlightenment as an age of reason and progress. But as we discussed in the earlier lecture today, but reason by whom and progress for whom. James Cone writes, perhaps it is true to say that the enlightenment created a revolution in the consciousness of Western man, but not all people are men and not all people are Western and not all people in the West experience the enlightenment in the same way. For black and red peoples in North America, the spirit of the enlightenment was socially and politically demonic, becoming a pseudo intellectual basis for their enslavement or extermination. These words uh, are difficult and heavy for many growing up uh, in the culture of America, but in order for individuals to see this view and this perspective, they must be challenged to take seriously another value system. And they must be made to see 
that what they are doing is making value judgments behind the processes that govern their intellectual frameworks. And of course, the progress on which the European Enlightenment depended was itself predicated on the bloodshed and suffering of millions of dispossessed Black, Brown, and Yellow lives across the colonized global South to subsidize the discovery of the new world for European explorers. The political dissident, cultural theorist, and novelist Ngugi Wa Thiongo writes, but obviously it was worse when the colonial child was exposed to images of his world as mirrored in the written languages of his colonizer, where his own native languages were associated in his impressionable mind with low status, humiliation, corporal punishment, slow-footed intelligence and ability or downright stupidity, non-intelligibility and barbarism, this was reinforced by the world he met in the works of such geniuses of racism as a writer Haggard or a Nicholas Montserrat, not to mention the pronouncement of some of the giants of Western intellectual and political establishments such as Hume, Jefferson, or Hegel with his Africa comparable to a land of childhood still enveloped in the dark mantle of the night as far as the development of self-conscious history was concerned. Hegel's statement that there was nothing harmonious with humanity to be found in the African character is representative of the racist images of Africans in Africa such a colonial child was bound to encounter in the literature of the colonial languages. The results could be disastrous. I showed in uh, my previous lecture this picture of Simon Raper's history of influence in philosophy. And most prominent is right here. This node in the network, the size of the node indicating the relative uh, citations, numbers of uh, people connecting their ideas to this individual. And is it any surprise that in a network dominated only by Europeans and within that network dominated by a genius of racism, as Ngugi points out, that our frameworks, the frameworks in which uh, people like Walter Scott are shot and killed without remorse by those who are in charge with our protection, is it any wonder that this is the strange fruit of these kinds of networks and systems? So I want us to think about knowledge as a tool of empire. Um, if we look at the root of the word science, most people are familiar with science in the Latin as to know. But if we go back further uh, in Latin to shindere, science also comes from a word that means to split or to cleave. And this is where we get the reductionist vision of science, where you divide something up into all its component parts and you say, if I understand each of those parts fairly well, because no one can understand them infinitely well, if I understand them each fairly well, then I'll understand the whole. And that's not always true. <laughs> and it's not always even a good uh, judgment to approximate it as true. And then if we go back further uh, to the Greek schizein or schizein, this is then to split. And then in the Sanskrit, we have he split. So we go from merely knowledge, knowing and understanding perhaps, all the way back to a split mind, to the idea of dividing the self up into many pieces as well as the world. So science as a tool is a great thing, just like a hammer is a great tool, but tools can be used for good or for ill. And we must understand big science, capital S science as a worldview, um, which ultimately leads to a mind split into pieces. So the goal of this lecture today, and hopefully that it can inspire others to do the same, is to use knowledge as a tool of understanding is, you know, even as this picture shows, right, that it's not perfect, right, but it is coherent and whole. There is an understanding of parts that operate within a larger whole, and we may not get everything right, we may not see all the pieces perfectly, but we can hope to understand by interrelation and interconnection. So I'd like to engage uh, a case study, um, the landmark repatriation of Tweed Manuscript 150, to give um, concrete uh, examples for how uh, we can think about 
um, these various isms and how they influence our knowledge systems from science to history, theology, and philosophy. So I've been privileged to learn from professors Alice Bellis and Gay Byron at the Howard University School of Divinity, who have worked tirelessly to highlight the treasures of the Tweed collection of Ethiopic manuscripts, which the university received from a prominent but now deceased American collector. This collection is one of the five largest in North, North America. Um, Professor Byron, in collaboration with Professor Gatachu Haile, discovered the provenance of Tweed Manuscript 150 um, in, in the early 2000s. And during the digitation process of the collection, spearheaded by Professor Bellis, it was determined that the manuscript should be returned to its monastery of origin. Memher Dr. Zebene Lemma, a double alumnus of Howard University and an official in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, mediated the rep repatriation between the university and the highest officials in the Tewahedo Church. For anyone who's interested, I wrote about the tumultuous saga of how this Ethiopic codex came into the hands of an American collector and finally returned to its home in the Los Angeles Review of Books. So, this 15th century copy that you see here of the Acts of Paul and Acts of Sarabaman once belonged to the ninth abbot of Debra Labanos Monastery in the Shewa region of Ethiopia. Included at the beginning of the codex is a guest text that was not part of the original design but added later with some Amharic characters and that presents a rare and valuable African royal historical record on encounters with the West in the early 1600s. According to the late Professor Haile, an eminent scholar of Ethiopic manuscripts and of the ancient Ga'ez language, the text from the Andre Tweed collection may be one of the oldest versions of the Acts of Paul in existence today. Tweed MS 150 may be the only extant copy of the Acts of Sarabaman, a text describing the life of another Jewish convert to Christianity who suffered martyrdom during the Diocletian persecutions in the world. So in the era of Black Lives Matter, a worldwide campaign is emerging to reclaim the encoded heritage of sacred artifacts for the ancestral communities from which they came. The return of Tweed MS-150 to Deborah Labanos in 2016 was the first time that any Western university has formally returned an artifact from its collection to the African continent and so marked a watershed in the engagement of Western institutions with cultural repatriation. And this inspiring act of selflessness, which runs so counter to the instincts of Western cultural curators, has led to my own journey of discovery regarding the role of Ethiopians and other Africans in the global history of the church. So recent works have opened new challenges and opportunities to contextualize the journeys made by various delegations of Ethiopians across the Mediterranean and to European locales as far north as Germany in the 14th and 15th centuries. In particular, historians Matteo Salvadore and Verena Krebs have rejected the prevailing paradigm of a unidirectional and hierarchical European encounter with Ethiopic civilization documenting both the diverse motivations and aspirations of Ethiopian kings, prelates, and interlocutors, as well as the reverence exhibited by Europeans for Ethiopic knowledge and Ethiopian displays of Christian piety and asceticism. The European encounter with, within their own lands of an ancient East African empire, and one even more shocking of shared Christian faith, was not complicated as much by race or color as by the vast gaps in geographic knowledge in Europe at the time, which often considered these envoys originating from one of the three Indies, roughly the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Indian subcontinent known at the time, and which conflated historical legends about distant presbyters with the lived experience of these Ethiopian explorers. You can see this still contained within the modern zeitgeist, right? If you look at the Marvel database, this idea of Prester John and uh, an, a, a, an ancient African black king who uh, ruled over this huge kingdom and had enormous powers is still in the modern consciousness. 
So this Ethiopian age of exploration is supported by Popple records going back as far as 1306, which is why I have a question mark here on the Ethiopian age of exploration. And 1306 was when Emperor Wedim Ra'ad sent a delegation of 30 Ethiopians to Europe seeking the king of the Spains. It's unclear whether they reached their destination and no known Ethiopian records of the counter encounter have yet been found to my knowledge. However, pilgrims to Rome identifiable as Ethiopian are evidenced in at least seven independent events from 1403 to 1442. And almost 50 Ethiopian pilgrims are attested in the second half of the 15th century. In 1449, Emperor Zara Yaikab dispatched a delegation to Naples with European accounts offering a faithful description of his power structure devoid of derogatory remarks. Further appreciation regarding Ethiopian cognoscenti. There are in Ethiopia many scientists and astrologists, physicians are held in high regard, conveys Ethiopian prowess in multiple fields of science, which Salvadore remarks seems all the more impressive when read against the standards of the Italian Renaissance. Martin Luther himself, and this is probably very prominent for a Protestant seminary, referenced admiringly the Ethiopian church and their faithful example in his writings, even meeting with the Ethiopian monk Michael the Deacon in 1534. David Daniels at McCormick Theological Seminary has written widely on this topic. Michael the Deacon obviously traveled very far to Wittenberg from Ethiopia to meet with Luther, right? Um, and the real question is, after this encounter in 1534, how did the uh, recurrent influences of Protestant thought evolve? But what about before 1517, the Reformation event? Added to these astounding revelations, there developed a vocal and robust reform movement in the Ethiopian church in the 15th century, led by Abba Estefanos, who was eventually martyred for his beliefs around 1450, 70 years before the Lutheran Reformation. His Stephanites worshiped no other than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They observed strict asceticism and both Sabbaths, Saturday and Sunday. They refused prostration before kings, angels, saints, relics, or icons. And they spoke out against those not following these practices, putting them into direct conflict with and suffering severe persecution from the Emperor Zara Yeika. The Ethiopian historian Tedese Tamrat writes that the Stephanite episode lasted for barely half a century, but it was highly characteristic of more than a hundred years of monastic development in Ethiopia. From Addis Ababa University, philologist Tawel de Berhan Desta recommends continued investigation into this pre lutherian church reform movement. That the post-conflict history of the sect has not been studied presents a profound opportunity for global historians and cultural curators to ask how Ethiopian Christian voyagers to Europe in the 15th and early 16th centuries may have been reciprocally influential in developing currents of Protestant thought. So I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm indebted to Professor Byron for her work on the Meroitic and Aksumite kingdoms and early East African currents in Christendom that were contemporary with and preceding the Holy Roman Empire. So just five years ago, I wouldn't have known anything about the Aksumite kingdom were it not for her work in this area. So if you go to Acts 8, we have the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian official sent by the Kandakes of Meroe in modern day Sudan, and his baptism by the disciple Philip. The biblical narrative follows Philip, but where does the history of the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ethiopian church go from here? And where else in the Bible do we see an encounter between an Ethiopian and a Hebrew near a body of water? 10 points if you can uh, get this one right. But uh, in Jeremiah 38 and 39, Ebed Melech, rescued the prophet Jeremiah from a cistern for which he was promised he would be delivered and not fall by the sword during the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. 
And uh, Professor Bellis has done a tremendous amount of work in this area that I'm, I'm also indebted to. So the Ethiopian Orthodox Church uh, has long standing origins, but it traces as an institution to Emperor Izana's conversion in Aksum, a kingdom distinct from Meroe in East Africa in the fourth century. And Izana's post-conversion inscription, predating the Council of Chalcedon in Europe by about a hundred years, contributed to the earliest Christian understandings of the Trinity. This and also potentially Ethiopian contributions to the Lutheran solas underscores their vibrant philosophical heritage. So part of the challenge with recovering this kind of history or uncovering this kind of history is the access to Ge'ez translation resources and translators. As I'm sure many seminarians are aware, besides Hebrew and Greek and Latin and European languages, there are a number of languages that are, let's say, under-resourced or under-translated, Syriac, Coptic, Ge'ez included. And if we had access to more translators and more resources to develop this body of text, what new or old historical discoveries could we find? Um, these are just three. My colleague Dag Herbjorn Srud in Norway has done a lot of work on the Ethiopian intellectual, not to be confused with the emperor, Zira Jakob, who was actually born 1599, but who wrote many treatises predating European Enlightenment thought, but containing many views that were much more open and aware and inclusive of women and other minority groups. In Bakum, in Bakom, who in the 1400s was a convert from Islam, who actually was a monk at Deborah Labanos Monastery and may have handled Tweed Manuscript 150, um, the Acts of Sarabaman and the Acts of Paul, is another student to study because he was a big, big proponent of uh, translation and intercultural communication. Um, and Bakum knew at least seven languages, include, including his own native Arabic, as well as Portuguese and, um, and Ge'ez. And in doing so, he was able to uh, develop texts that communicated between Christianity and is Islam. Then there are also the Aksumite scholars, of which I know personally very little, but I'm sure there's historical work that is being uncovered, even now archaeologically, in Aksum. So why is translation so important to the Christian faith? Lamin Sane, professor of global Christianity at Yale Divinity School until his passing in 2019, wrote in his book, Whose Religion is Christianity? The Gospel Beyond the West. How more people pray and worship in more languages in Christianity than in any other religion in the world. Furthermore, Christianity has been the impulse behind the creation of more dictionaries and grammars of the world's languages than any other force in history. Obviously, these facts of cultural and linguistic pioneering conflict with the reputation of Christianity as one colossal act of cultural intolerance. That Islam should spread as well as it does and still preserve the Quran in the original Arabic makes for a fascinating study in contrast and illuminates a crucial feature of the temper of Christianity as a religious dispensation. Without a counterpart to the revealed Quran of Muslims, Christians transmitted their scripture in the languages of other people, indicating thereby that these languages have a priority in the Christian scheme. This is more than just a tactical concession to win converts. It is rather an acknowledgement that languages other people's languages have intrinsic merit for communicating the divine message. They are worthy of God's attention. So we touched on this also in the Q&A, um, but where is the line drawn between the scientific and the pre-scientific? And this relates to our study of languages, cultures, and history. Returning to the Kushite official from Meroe, modern day Sudan, who is baptized by Philip in Acts 8, we have a named witness to a first century human teleportation event. So how cool is that? Where and when do observations become scientific? Consider the narrative of the Magi in the Gospel of Matthew chapter two, 
these wise men or kings are determined with variants in the traditions from different cultures to represent foreigners from Sub-Saharan Africa or Ethiopia as it was known then, Arabia and India. And you see some commonalities between the mythology around Prester John and his origins. But let's take the biblical narrative seriously. What tools would be required to chart a course like this over such a long distance and arrive within a few months of the Messiah's birth? One, a deep reverence for the Hebrew king foretold by the prophets to invest in such a journey. And two, an understanding of astronomy. Where do we see evidence for that in the Bible? Well, in the book of Daniel, we are witnesses to a learned Babylonian civilization whose rulers were impressed by the faith and commitment of a group of exiled Hebrew boys. Could Daniel's testimony and vision have convinced the Babylonians to send emissaries to Judea near the time of Jesus' birth? And did they have the necessary knowledge to get there? So as recently as 2021, scholars studying Plimpton 322, one of the most sophisticated and interesting mathematical objects from antiquity, have gained a deeper appreciation of Babylonian trigonometry, proto-calculus, and astronomy, which was acknowledged widely by the likes of Isaac Newton and Nicholas Copernicus. What other recoveries of history will emerge as we continue to look beyond the frame of the Eurocentric narrative? So I ask the question, with which eyes are you seeing? It is important to remember that we have more than merely our physical eyes and we must use them in understanding wisdom. Lamensane, um, before his passing, wrote that in the eyes of God, no one's person humanity is intrinsically more or less worthwhile than another's. The social structure may contradict it and may, we may even benefit by that contradiction, but self-interest may not override it. A deeper self-interest demands the sense of a shared humanity. To translate is not an option for the church. So let's consider again the observational capacity of the subjective, the person, the individual. Um, how do we increase observational capacity of the self in order to enhance our observational capacity of the outer worlds accessible to us in the cosmos? We have communities of subjectives making observations. And within those communities, we have the observation and sharing of intimate truths about the self, in spiritual communities especially. These observations can sometimes be private and sometimes cooperative, but they are necessary to develop a sense of communal and self-identity. So we return again to the foundational question, what is truth? What stands at the heart of our observational subjectivity and within the whole of external, objective, perceptual reality. Is science the only way to perceive truth? And I answer to that an emphatic no. A subjective in the natural world may also apprehend truth directly through pattern, prayer, and perseverance. And there may be disagreement about this may be a quasi-scientific process or a scientific process. So the definitions aren't so important as much as these are tools with which all human beings have access. Pattern through the word, through language, through the divine logos, the ordering that is present everywhere in creation, right? So we have pattern that can be discerned. There is order. Then we also have prayer. And of course, we have perseverance, which is another word for experience, but perseverance in the midst of pain. Um, Soren Kierkegaard was beautifully expressed in Fear and Trembling why Abraham is regarded as the father of, the, of monotheism. Why is he given this elite status by the God of the Hebrews? And it's really in his faith, in his inability to confirm or corroborate his subjective apperception of the divine and what the divine was telling him to do 
that makes him the knight of faith in Kierkegaard's description. But there are other uh, mystical ways that the spirit interpenetrates the physical world that we must think about. Um, there's a well-documented dialogue between the psychiatrist Carl Jung and the physicist Wolfgang Pauli over there's some 20 years of correspondence in which Jung analyzed Pauli's dreams that were the source of his inspiration for scientific discovery. Pauli went on to win the Nobel Prize in physics. Ngugi wa Thiongo, who I referenced before, describes beautifully the duality of language. And I've here put parentheses so that you can understand the different parts that I've discussed in these lectures. A proverb, a codification of spiritual wisdom, has the three parts of the cognitive process. A sensory experience, something that our physical mind, our physical bodies can take part in, from which emerges a story a subjective that in turn becomes the basis of a universal, generalizing pithy statement applicable in similar situations. So we go from the sub subjective to the objective and neither is a bad word, neither is a good word. It's just that subjective can be relatively true or false depending upon the statement that's made, just like objective statements can be similarly true or false. So Ngugi reminds us that in this world, a scientific world, we necessarily require riddle, parable, poetry, and metaphor, because we must integrate these different aspects of the human experience of reality. So for those who may be concerned that in the relinquishing of universal objectivity, there's no claims to truth that can be made, or there's no uh, truth claims that are more valuable than others. I don't think many people would engage that discussion seriously, but um, it's something to address. And so one of the issues that quantum physics raises for us is this issue of multiple observers and the multiplicity of observers. Even the early uh, uh, proponents of quantum theory, including Eugene Wigner, uh, London and Bauer, um, there were many, tried to resolve this paradox that emerges is you have a system, a quantum system under study, and you've got an observer with that system. But then you've got an observer observing the observer and the system together, and you've got another observer observing the observer, and then you have an infinite regress of subjectives there. So by relinquishing universal objectivity, we say, no, in fact, uh, you know, Schrodinger's cat in the box knows, in fact, if it is alive or dead, but the observer outside of the box can only say that the cat and the uh, binary atomic decay are in superposition, right? So different observers will experience and relate to observations in a different way. And they can still be consistent even though they do not agree. So we have these systems, these nonlinear systems that are coupled between an observer and a subsystem. And we have what Wigner called his friend, right? A, 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 a subjective that's observing a subjective, observing a system. And then we have communities of subjectives that make observations together and who can often agree on those measurements, which is a miracle in and of itself. But how do we resolve the infinite regression of subjectives to the individual who chooses and selects the observations to make, the consciousness that is within, as well as an observer that stands outside of physical reality, observing and the only one who has full knowledge and awareness of the wave function of the universe. So this UFO would stand whether the universe is open or closed in general relativity or cosmology is another question, such that each observational subjective, in fact, all communities of all subjectives throughout history will encounter that observer inexorably at the end of space time. The ultimate and final observer stands within each observational subjective and leads us to awareness of our inner and outer realities. So how do we access truth from a Christological perspective, which may be more relevant to uh, seminarians who are going into the church 
to, to counsel and minister from that perspective. None of us here today are first century Palestinian Jews. So why is Jesus of Nazareth such an important figure in the revelation of truth? And how can such a culturally specific figure represent access to truth for all cultures, for all times, both before and after the historical figure's birth and death? These are deep questions that demand serious answers. I'm, and I'll only scratch the surface by saying, that each individual must encounter Christ afresh in every culture and in every generation, not merely through the text, not merely through parental, communal, or religious impartation, but rather as individual subjectives, asking questions of and receiving answers from truth within their personalized experiences. The most beautiful part about such discovery of truth is that it is never afraid of questions, no matter how many other subjectives are unable or unwilling to answer them. So in every culture, every community, within every individual, there are a host of questions about how their life may relate to Jesus of Nazareth. The access point of truth, right? The person of truth. The person who claims that I am the way, the truth, and the life in the book of John. So returning to our discussion of Buber, the first and third person descriptions, a first person story and a third person objective reality, a, those, both of those descriptions are mediated by the encounter with the second person, an encounter with thou. Rather than Descartes' formulation, I think, therefore I am, which is actually preceded by, I doubt, therefore, I think, there is another possibility that I propose. Sumus ergo refero, we are, therefore, I relate. What might be the consequences of such a shift in philosophical frame? So it is the truth that you know, that you have intimate contact with, and that you have internalized as your own that will set you free. Not another's truth, not the truth that's out there in the world on Wikipedia and in social media channels, not merely cumulative truths out there, but deep hidden and personalized truth within you. The still small voice will whisper. So the construction I proposed, we are, therefore I relate, is nothing new, especially to African or communal cultures. And we can see it in the languages of the people. Archbishop Desmond Tutu popularized the phrase Ubuntu during the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a sense that all individual humanity is bound up with other humanities. And we see it here in the Gakuyu, the word for that which connects material and abstract being, do, the being of phenomenal nature, nurture, thought, and spirit, the primary substance of all being, interdependent, both physical and beyond, that people detected in the reality surrounding their lives. This is not pre-science. In fact, quantum field theory, one of our most precise theories of the universe, brings us back to this ground of being brings us back to the tohu abohu of Genesis 1. Their meaning is imprinted in the language. We in the West have benefited and should continue to learn from such a grand philosophical unification. So Albert Einstein reincarnated this conceptual frame, not quoting uh, Gakuyu, of course, but in his essay, The World as I See It, identifying that secret place at which we find the crucible of all true creative acts. And the late Toni Morrison, who could always turn the most humble of subjectives into a source of poetic glory, did the same for Pakola Breedlove, the young black female protagonist of The Bluest Eye, who shows us that the most difficult questions are the ones science and our knowledge systems can never, ever answer. So as we all stand on the shoulders of giants, I stand on the shoulders of these luminaries. And so I leave you with the following from my own subjective experience. Um, and the heights of your truth will only be matched by the depths of your trust, especially in your pain. <laughs>
So thank you so much for your time and attention. I look forward to the conversation and um, the respondents uh, response. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I hope you all could hear me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nolasco, and uh, for the invitation, and Dr. Kurian for the opportunity to respond to your lecture. Um, your take on Acts 8 and Mark, uh, Matthew 2 is so refreshing and much needed in my field. I wish more of my biblical studies colleagues could have heard you. And uh, as a biblical scholar, um, this is quite an amazing conversation to be part of because, as you all know, we are usually stuck stuck in the realm of text or textual of the literary of the Greco-Roman and Jewish milieu that happened at least 2000 years ago. So the word quantum is something that one does not hear often or at all in our biblical field. Um, I tried to do some research and the closest one I saw was vector fields and pneumatology and uh, yeah. And so the title of my response is the scientific is not enough to save biblical studies. And I'll be responding with two guiding inquiries. The first one is, what does biblical studies have to do with science or scientific? Second, what does biblical studies have to do with quantum biology? Responding to the first question, what does biblical studies have to do with science or scientific? Since the inception of the so-called enlightenment period of the Western Europe, the interpretation of the Bible has tried to move away, although not completely from the parochial, ecclesial church-based interpretation of the Bible to the academic or the secular interpretation of the Bible. The Europeans did so as a way to challenge the powers that be actually, to liberate the mass from the corruption of the church. They did so as an act of defiance for most cases. They read the Bible with historical and scientific methods in order to create room for those who dissent. Thus began the rise of biblical studies departments, programs in the universities and colleges. The intention was somewhat noble and even liberating at first. However, this legacy of liberation has turned into a weapon of colonization where the periphery became the new center. The dissenting became the dissented. The liberatory became oppressive. As the Christian Europeans colonized the world a few hundred years ago, they forced, among many other things, their reading of the Bible. And that is white male Eurocentric reading of the Bible. Even today, after more than 100 for some nations, two or 300 years for other nations, the legacy of white male Eurocentric reading of the Bible endures, thrives, and is even considered the hallmark of biblical interpretation even today. I am a Korean from the Philippines, and in the Philippines, many, not all, but many of the biblical interpretations published recently still replicate the centering of white male European and American biblical interpreters as the sole legitimate, correct, scientific interpretations of the Bible. Encouraging biblical interpretations that center Filipino and Filipina experience and Filipino and Filipina systems and values of knowledge are looked down upon as unacademic, unworthy of being considered into serious scholarship. The depth and trauma of colonial brainwashing that happened for almost 400 years cannot be taken lightly. So what is this white male Eurocentric reading of the Bible? Simply put, reading the Bible with historicity and scientific methods in mind. It is to read the Bible's apparently objectively and with the best scientific rigor where the reader is supposed to excavate the truth, capital T, and the goal is to come up with the best interpretation that will trump everyone else. To do so is to give the most evidence, detached, obviously, objective, uninfluenced by any outside intervention and repeatable, 
by any biblical scholar where the truth is verifiable by its repeatability. And this is what we call scientific. To be honest with you, to claim one's reading or interpretation of the Bible as scientific for me is mind boggling. What is so scientific of what we do? Every interpretation of the Bible, and I apologize for such word, I think it's a guess, an assumption, a, hypo a hypothesis, if I may. We are reading texts written at least 2,000 years ago and longer for other texts and act like we know more than the authors themselves. For the most part, we actually don't even know who the authors are. If Jesus actually comes back today, biblical scholars would scoff at his second coming because we would say that his parousia is unbiblical and unscientific. We scoff because according to our scientific models, this Jesus is an extraneous variable to our scientific and time-tested models. He does not look like Solomon's head of Christ. Um, by the way, for those who are actual scientists and quantum physicists in the room, please don't ask me for the scientific models biblical scholars use every time we say that we read the Bible with scientific criticism. Uh, or methods, because actually we have nothing resembling what you're doing. Uh, our models are closer to anthropology and social sciences. Biblical scholars actually rip each other apart in annual meetings if someone contradicts the so-called objective truth constructed by dead white men from Europe. We worship at the feet of this constructed objective truth, as Dr. Kurian suggests, psydolatry, where a heathens beware. In other words, in the field of biblical studies, there is a vested interest in preserving this so-called scientific method. A contemplative text, a text of faith, if I may, a text about the oppressed people and their struggles became a text chained at the mercy of trying to look scientific. Why then are we trying to look scientific? Why do we want science or scientific to save us? Here, and this is my opinion, I see white fragility manifesting themselves. To preserve the scientific method of reading the Bible is to fight for the hegemony of white male Eurocentrism of what has been. For a long period of time, to give you an example, the theological dictionary of the New Testament is considered one of the most important dictionary, aka lexicon in the New Testament studies. It was a must read, must use for every biblical scholar, or at least those who have access to it. It was not until after the Holocaust, scholars started to critique the dictionary because of its anti-Semitic tendencies. For many scholars today, they try or we try not to use this. However, to reach this level of consciousness pushback of acknowledging the subjectives took some time and convincing. Why? Because many contributors of this editorial volume were prominent scholars. Some or many of them are anti-Semitic perhaps, and I think so. And yet the academia is at one point tried to look the other way just because it was written primarily by white male powerful Eurocentric scholars. All of these in the name of science apparently. And yet there is a movement, although small, in the field of biblical studies that challenge this hegemony. And this goes back to my second question or second inquiry. What does biblical studies have to do with quantum biology? This dissenting movement that challenges the so-called scientific reading of the Bible invites, as, during, as Dr. Korean says, we are therefore we relate, an acknowledgement to relate to oneself, to one's context, to learn from and with nature, to how one is both an oppressor and oppressed in interpreting the Bible, post-colonial. Of course, as Dr. Curran argues, this invitation is not and should not be about navel gazing. Rather, it brings out to the open, the not so invisible white male hand that pushes a certain reading of the Bible. It calls out the gatekeepers, especially on their criteria 
if they ever have one, uh, for judging certain biblical interpretation to be worthy or not. Inspired by quantum physics and biology, I hope, I hope that we could read a Bible without the explicit necessity for the so-called scientific in order to prove our worth. We can let go of our elitist desire, our hyperinflated, bruised egos, the need to look scientific so that we will be taken seriously by other academic fields. I'm not arguing that we should hate science. We should work with science, with quantum physics or biology, but we could let our academic hair down, even just for once, let go of our strict textual reductionism. To read the Bible with quantum thinking is to allow room for mystery, to allow room for the affective, that we do not have to follow the mantra of, if it's not in the text, it does not count. We are free to feel our interpretations and read the Bible with our touch, smell, our context, and be honest with our biases. This is an invitation for an epistemic shift on how we read the Bible. This episteme is both the method and the disposition of the reader and interpreter. Could we reread the Bible as activists, not with the intent of becoming messianic, but of relating, being in communion, of being in ontologically fluid relationality with all of creations? Could we require Ethiopian or Coptic as language requirements for attaining a PhD degree? Could we trace Christianity not just toward the West, but towards the South or even the East? Could we endorse spiritual pilgrimage toward places that are not commercialized? In all of this, and this is my conclusion, the scientific, the scientific is not enough to save biblical studies. And yet, correlationality and interconnectivity and other things, in my opinion, cannot be determined as messianic as well. We hope and relate. We open ourselves to new ways. We live out our new episteme, but these new ways should always be approached with caution because we have already witnessed that what is liberating right now could turn into an oppressive and hegemonic system if we are not cautious. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Dr. Jung and Dr. Kurian. This is such an amazing um, presentation and response offered here. I love it. Um, I wish we could just have more of these kinds of conversations. Um, I would like to invite those who are um, here as listeners, you know, if you have questions, please put them in the uh, Q&A and I will uh, read them out loud for um, discussion. In the meantime, I wonder if Dr. Kurian and Dr. Zhang, if you have, um, you know, questions or comments or, you know, thoughts that uh, you want to engage further before I turn to the Q&A box here. So um, Dr. Jung, if you'll allow me, I have so many thoughts from your wonderful response. So I love the concept that you phrased uh, as hermeneutics as hypothesis, biblical interpretation as a hypothesis, because that it's so essential to the process of science um, and just to the process of questioning, right? So as we approach the text, the text is not all that we have, right? I mean, we have archaeology, we've got uh, we've got, uh, you know, the, the movement of tectonic plates, we've got um, a sense of imagination to the text. And, you know, people like Ruha Benjamin, people like uh, Sadea Hartman have done a great job of helping us to see that, you know, even when we approach a historical text, speculative fiction, speculative histories around that allow us to imagine. I mean, in fact, my, my own enlightenment or growth with understanding the importance of the Ethiopic church emerged from that sense of hypothesis. Like, where did the Ethiopian unit go? Where did, where, like, where are these stories, right? Like, what is, you know, we see Cush referenced in Genesis. What's going on there? Like, there's all these questions that we say, okay, since it's not there, it's not in the canon, we, we leave it alone. But 
I mean, we have information there. We have Daniel and Babylon. And then we've got archaeologists coming out in 2021 saying, you know, it's it was known by the great scientists, even the European Enlightenment, that the Babylonians and others, the Egyptians from whom so much was taken around the Mediterranean, that these people knew what they were talking about. And that heliocentrism, the idea that, you know, th this is something that Mayan culture, Egyptian culture, you know, there were elements of this. And we give credit, we give an enormous amount of credit to those within the canon, within the hegemony, within the power structure, when they are just copious, they are scribes, just like the scribes of old. It's not to diminish their contribution, but it is to essentialize the placement that not everything goes from west to east. There is movement of knowledge from east to west. And the ancients understood that. They understood that. The Arabs, the Africans, they, they understood this very well. So um, I, I could say a lot about scientific criticism, the use of the word science as a bludgeon. Science is so it just like Bible thumpers can use it to beat the head over with people, science is used as a bludgeon in the same way. Um, and it is not the truth. It's not coextensive with the truth. It is a tool and we must use it as such. Wow, amen to that, Dr. Kieran. Amen to the things that you said. Um, my response is first, there are a lot of biblical scholars, especially even today, that are in denial in denial of their biblical interpretations where they just don't want to talk about how much they're involved in their traditions. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't want to, and when I say tradition, I'm not just talking about the church tradition, but I'm talking about the Western epistemologies and mm. they, they don't want to write about that. They don't want to mention anything about that. And yet clearly when you read between the lines, they manifest themselves so much. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when somebody makes some big truth claims without giving us any contextual caveat of where they're coming from, and I say, could we talk about that? And they'll be very defensive and say, no, it's, this is not about me. This is just about the text. And the second part of what you said about the East and West and all this, you know, mixing of different cultures and the ethnic or the groups. Uh, speaking of Acts, actually, in the latter part of Acts, it talks about this person named Simon the Niger or nigger. Yes, yes. When people read Acts of the Apostles, our <laughs> whiteness is on, uh, you know, hyperdrive, <laughs> I may use it. And people read Acts of the Apostles with such whiteness lens that we think that the early church is white. However, according to Acts, there was a black person, Ethiopian maybe, or Cretan, somewhere in the Southern region, a black person considered a leader who, authorized Paul to start the missions. Mm. What about that? Mm -hmm. No, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right now, I mean, you're, you're con there's a conference going on at Oxford uh, on the philosopher Zira Yaakov. And mm. one of the, the biggest currents of thought is still dominated by a Italian fascist named Conti Rossini, mm. who wrote the first texts about Zira Jacob. And, you know, during the period of Italian fascism was uh, very vocal in describing the work of this Ethiopian philosopher in a cave, um, describing it as a forgery done by a European. Right. Wow. And so that still influences that entire world today. So the the question and, and there are prominent Ethiopian scholars from all institutions who are like, listen, this this it couldn't have been produced by even the most skilled forger in get in Ge'ez, the, the script. So it, it it just it amazes me how people who are scientific can hold on to such unscientific views about reality. And it's because they have a vested interest in excluding legitimate, rational, and thoughtful critique from their worldview. And so their, their just reward will be the limitations of their worldview. 
and the lack of access. And we see it in our world. We saw it in that video at the present. Mm -hmm. we, we see the, the, the frayed edges of the Western worldview. And, 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 and there's gonna be a day when it needs to be rehauled and, and hopefully the day is sooner than later. I hope so too, definitely. Yeah. I was going to say that just listening to both of you speaking, I was reminded of um, uh, you know, something that happens frequently um, and it has happened several times during my teaching um, you know, uh, lifespan. And that is that um, when, when you offer a course, for example, on you know, feminist theology or womanist theology, it's considered not real theology. Mm. And they're thinking it's not real theology because in their mind, they have a normative canon of what constitute real theology. And they don't realize that what they're thinking of real theology is a very contextual European um, inherited theology, right? So I think, I mean, what that you know, signifies is that often the burden of um, specificity fall on those communities who have not been part of this um, construction of what is normative or what is the standard or, you know, how you know truth. Um, whereas the dominant group, um, in, in an uneven structure often do not have to specify, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in a way they presume they have no context exactly. because they're, they're the universal, right? Universal. And it seems to me that in the conversation that, that we're having this afternoon with both of you too, um, this is a question, right? Well, when you arrive and make claims to truth, um, we, you know, how do we go about engaging with those who presume that what they know to be truth is universal, right? Um, and that it is the only truth that there is. And I think that's the real, real, you know, um, um, that provoking thing for me. Um, and also, I just want to point out that, um, you know, even with Christianity as a religious tradition, um, we have some really transformative dimensions to it from the earliest stages, right? But as it, as it becomes part of the Roman Empire with Constantine in the 300s, that the idea of um, peace and security, right, uh, translates into forms of domination to those that the empire is ruling over and colonizing. And that tradition has continued even today when particularly Christianized um, imperial nations go on these modes of um, civilization using the logic of law and order. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we just had a dissertation where, you know, he talked about this idea of law and order, how Christian it is, uh, particularly with like Billy Graham recently in the 60s and 70s, and how that led to um, the carceral regimes that we have today. You know, <laughs> there's a Christian theological underpinning to this too. So I think even within sort of provincialized forms of knowledge, like let's say particular knowledges, we also have um, dangers too. So there's always this, this challenge to be self-reflective, I think self-critical, right? Yeah, the, 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 the tone of what you're saying about carceral knowledges, it reminds me of Foucault's subjugated knowledges or the mm -hmm. idea that you've got these things on the periphery that are that are outside the dominant frame or the universal, whatever is the strong nodes in your network. And you've got people who are asking questions on the periphery in science, outside of science, theology, but then you've got these questions that are beautiful questions that when you start digging, you're like, oh, okay, they're just misacknowledged, unacknowledged, sometimes oppressed, but then like, you, you start digging and you say, wait, there's so much here. There's so much richness. There's so, it opens a new conversation. And then you start saying, oh, these systems really were built. They were built with people who are in this conversation, not in mind, right? And that's, um, yeah, it's something that I just, uh, we really have to unearth. We have to do the work to unearth that knowledge so that we can have this conversation, you know? And it's hard work, right? Because you're, you're operating at the margins of disciplines. And if you, you go to scientific conferences, the, the real challenge for, that I find with a lot of scientists is that they don't think about philosophy at all. They don't mm. think about it. And in fact, many, I think, would say science is the truth. They would just leave it at that. And, you know, it, this is our models are the truth. 
not the great ones, not the really great scientists, but the, 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 the rank and file in science, very believers in that, that this is all totality of reality because it's all they can see. Just like your biblical studies colleagues, uh, Dr. Jung, who say, all we have is the text, that's it. And the text that we have, that's all of reality, right? Um, so this will conclude our um, conference today. Um, I want to um, express gratitude to Dozer for the grant that made this possible to faculty and students who participated in our semester long reading group on Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology, and to our doctoral students for sharing the research this morning. To all the people doing behind the scenes tech work that made this very seamless, to Dr. Kurian for fabulous presentations that created space for a generative dialogue that we hope will continue. And um, I might just add that I didn't realize you were a theologian. So. Oh, I don't think I am, but <laughs> thank you. Oh, You're pretty you. close. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, and thank you to all who made time on a Saturday to join us for this conversation. And we hope today has been thought provoking as well as opening up different frames of thinking that is decolonial, transformative, and attends to all the multiplicity of relations that make our planetary sociality so that we might reduce suffering and envision our becoming otherwise. To end, I want to paraphrase uh, Fanon, who is known to have said, let me be a person who never stops questioning. <laughs>